edition of Ask the Millionaire. Hope all of you are doing well. Uh, it is a rainy day here in Philadelphia, but otherwise everything is pretty good. So let's jump into the questions that we have today. The first question is from Carrington Crothers. Carrington writes, in regards to taxes, taxes, what are ways or things that should be done throughout the year to optimize savings come to the next uh, tax season. I'm a commercial brand photographer in Massachusetts creating content for small and medium sized businesses. As the new year is still freshly, uh, fairly fresh, I was wondering what should be done throughout the remainder of the year to help with savings and reduce stress uh, come next tax season or if there are any tips and tricks to the process to optimize your taxes. If I were you, and this is a pretty simple answer uh, to this question, I would actually just go and contact uh, a tax attorney and ask them what they think. Because every industry is a little bit different and there might be different types of tax advantages that you can take uh, look into uh, being a uh, commercial photographer. Also, if you know you're going to make a lot of money this year, then you might want to uh, front load all of your expenses. Most people do that at the end of the year. They pay expenses for the following, the next year in the current year so they could reduce the taxes in the current year. So they do that. But if I were you, my best suggestion to you is to talk to an accountant and ask them for advice on this. The next question is from Todd Ferguson. Todd writes, what benefits did you add for your team first uh, to help with retention and new talent acquisition, insurance, retirement, and other things. We run a 3PL third-party logistics warehouse that stores and sends products for our customers to various e-commerce websites. We currently have 22 people on staff, most are entry-level workers. We need to hire at a high, at least one high-level manager this year, as well as create retention among our current staff to be able to find higher quality workers with better compensation package that includes benefits. We currently offer PTO to all employees as well as other various small perks throughout the year. Todd, it sounds like you're doing a lot of the right things to me. But what I've done and, and think you should consider is a few things. One is I always tell my employees that if there's any types of things that their kids are involved in, that that comes first and that they should let uh, the manager know that their child is in a softball game, a play, whatever that may be, so you don't miss that. And I found that employees really appreciated that. I also uh, gave them quarterly vacation time. So I myself, after the, if they stayed a year, we gave them a week off per quarter if they wanted to go and take it. I also um, covered all their insurance and I built that into the total compensation. So they might get less in terms of their overall salary, but I paid their entire health care benefits. So people didn't look so much at their salary as they looked at, oh wow, I'm not putting anything out for my health care benefits. That was really powerful to them. Another thing that I did was I got uh, the employees together and ask them what benefits could we be providing and then I shared with them our financial numbers so they could see what we could potentially afford with me still making a reasonably good profit and in most cases I always had outside investors um, so the investors also could make it so it was very transparent explain to them what we we're looking for but when people have the ability to uh, shape their own future and have a say you find that they'll work with you on those things and they'll make sure it's kind of a win-win for everybody because nobody wants to kill the business that they're in. And most people just want a place that they go to that they feel appreciated and enjoy the camaraderie of the people that they work with and find the uh, work, if not interesting, at least they enjoy the environment that they're in. So again, I would uh, look at uh, making sure that they know that family comes first, that they can get to those events, that you know, health care insurance is important, and also that if you're able to help them put away money and add to that, like a 401k or something along those lines, 
that would add a lot of value and see again what your employees might come up with as their own retention interest so that way they can help you out and they also become great recruiters i've had clients who their employees did all the recruiting for them never had to lay out any money in terms of hiring recruiters or running ads because people knew the kind of people that fit into that culture and who they wanted next to them. Uh, the next question is for from Jimmy uh, Alexinko. I hope I pronounced that name correctly. Uh, what long-term marketing strategies can I implement in my uh, business today that will fill my pipeline with clients? I'm a flooring contractor with uh, my main job is to install flooring in clients' houses. I subcontract for, uh, for a flooring store and I also work with a lead company that sells me leads. Lately the store and the lead selling company have been slow and I'm looking at new marketing strategies that will fill my pipeline with constant clients so that I can stay busy all the time. Uh, Jimmy, I'm kind of surprised that you're not so busy that you even had time to write this considering what we're hearing about the housing market. That being said, I would, uh, if I were you, I would get to know realtors because they are in fir the first people who are being contacted by homeowners and they're often asked, hey, do you have any contractor recommendations? So I would get to know all of the realtors in your uh, region and I would sponsor things uh, with the local realtor association. And then I would look for contractors who don't do your work and let them know that you'd be interested in giving them a percentage of uh, every one of your projects, or maybe they build that into the price already, but I would definitely contact contractors that don't put flooring in, who may be general contractors and are looking to subcontract uh, that work myself. And I would also put in and get permission or take pictures of without letting people know where this is, Take pictures of the work that you do. Put that on your website. Put that on um, uh, Instagram. Put, uh, put that out on Twitter. Let people know the kinds of work you're doing and the different types of floors you put in. Also, you might create a floor calculator. What I mean by that is people are always wondering, what's it going to cost me to do this floor? If you had a floor cal calculator, people could put that information in and then uh, once they filled it out and they sent it, you could tell them, now that you've given me that information, I'll come back for you and tell you what different types of flooring would cost you. And so that would be of great help. I don't think anything like that exists uh, currently, but that would be a good way to get people to send you leads because they're just curious. I mean, what, what would a hardwood floor cost? What would a fake? looking hardwood floor cost. And if they can give you all the measurements, now you've gotten leads automatically. So again, I would go uh, with getting to know the realtors and sponsoring things uh, with their organization. I'd go to the contractors. I'd put things on Instagram so all your friends uh, will know about it and can share it with other people. I would create this calculator so people could figure out what their costs are going to be and how that's going to work out. And I think uh, you should get definitely more business. And again, I don't know the region of the country you're in. I don't know if things have slowed down or people don't have the money, depending on where you are. But uh, I can assure you, if you were in Philadelphia, you'd be more than uh, busy uh, because the market here is crazy. The next question is from Sherry Morris. Sherry asks, in selecting a location for your business, what are, see what are some key considerations? My fitness business will require suspension from the structure which already limits my options. Most landlords won't approve of this. I'm imagining it's some kind of like hanging yoga that you're doing. I have two locations available currently. Location one offers great visibility, first gen, so more built, some, uh, so more build out required, some build out required, but it's a blank slate with clearly dependable structure and generous uh, TI allowance. It is a newer area that's trending in our area now. It sounds great so far. However, it's much smaller space with a considerably higher rental rate. Location two is an older building with a quaint feel and is much larger space, a lower rental. So I have room to offer more services, adding to the bottom line. However, it's unclear if the structure 
can support the dynamic load required for my businesses without reinforcing the trusses until I do some demo and, and pay to have us build a CAD drawing. Wow, it sounds like a huge investment uh, there. So maybe you're better off with the first location if the numbers add up and you can uh, get enough people to use your facility. And also, I guess a lot of it also depends in your new facility what, how, what hours people are using it. So if you have this smaller facility and people aren't using it most of the day, but a lot of people use it in the evening or first thing in the morning, and you can't really accommodate those people, maybe the numbers aren't just going to work out. Uh, for you and you need the larger space. It could be that you still need to keep looking. Again, I don't know how many people that you need to be able to have in the gym at any one time or how many members that you need on a monthly basis just to break even before it's profitability. I don't know if the insurance will be greater in this particular facility as opposed to uh, the newer facility as opposed to the older facility. I don't, uh, there's a lot of variables there, but when you're selecting for this, the thing to do is get as close to your customer base as possible. If, if you're with a young customer base and you think that this uh, newer location, even though it's more money and smaller space, maybe you can expand in that facility or maybe you can expand in that area. But if that geographic area is the right area that people could walk to your place where it's a very short drive, I would prefer to go with that than an out-of-the-way place that might be less expensive and it's a bigger facility because at the end of the day, if you're not able to get uh, these customers to come in, that's a problem. I, as I mentioned, I live in Philadelphia and I drive through this one area of Philadelphia where a lot of young people live and already, this is post-pandemic here, three gyms have closed. And I don't know why they've closed, but they were all in good locations. Maybe uh, they were all within a few blocks of each other, so they might have uh, essentially killed each other by the fact that there may not be enough people to uh, pay for all of this. But again, for a long time, those gyms were very successful. And so I think the best thing to do is always look at the location first. The next question is from Alex Wilkins. Alex asks, how do I enforce a cell phone policy? I have a landscape business. Last year, any spare minute, guys would be on their phone. I'm not dealing with that, uh, that this year. I was going to put in the handbook. If I catch someone on their phone three times in a week or a month, they're fired. I don't mind them being on their phone during lunch or while riding on to the job. No cell phone once we're on the job suite or while loading and unloading tools. I just can't afford to pay people to be on their phone. The time is always ticking. Thank you. So Alex, here's what I would tell the people. Explain to them why this is important. It's not that you're punishing them because they're being on the phone. One is you have an obligation to the client for them to stay focused and do a great job uh, for the client. Two is you don't want anybody to get injured uh, while they're on the job. And again, that affects them personally, that affects your insurance, that affects uh, the deliverable to the client. So I would let them know why this is important uh, for that. And I would tell them if that's something they cannot abide by, then they're in the wrong place. And, and they should tell you what employer would find that or if they, if they were the employer, would find that acceptable. So I would tell them, Unless it's an emergency and you look at your phone and it's one of your kids or your, or your significant other, then you gotta let that go and let people know. And you should let it ring through anyway <clears throat> because if it is a problem and you hear it and you pick up your phone and you look, you can say, hey, okay, I'll get back to you. I mean, often my kids call when I'm uh, at a meeting or uh, I'm working on something and I just, when I see it ring, if I can't take it, I just, push it up and I tell them, I'll call you back later. And if they call, text me, dad, it's an emergency, then I call them right back. But other than that, that's how I handle it. So again, uh, it can't be that you just tell them that's not acceptable. You have to explain to them why it's not acceptable. And I think after they hear the why, I think they'll be more, uh, be more reasonable. 
Uh, the next is from Crystal Reyes. Crystal writes, how do I determine or calculate the right pricing according to my expenses? I'm a nail technician in the beauty industry and I'm feeling like I might be undervaluing myself and, price and my pricing, but I feel stuck. I have checked price menus in my area, but they aren't uh, both rental. They are uh, commission based. Ah, so, you know, if you can't find what that is, uh, you can always actually go uh, yourself to your competitors, which I've done before, and let them um, tell you what the pricing is. And the other thing is you should figure out what all your expenses are and then get into your pricing. So if you know that your rent is this, your electric is this, all your supplies, once you figure out all of your expenses and you see what that number comes down to, now you know, here's how much I need to make on an hourly basis in order for me to be able to uh, afford uh, this along with you know all the things that you're looking to go and accomplish. So look at all of your expenses and how much that's cost you. Figure out how much you can make per hour and then determine if uh, the number of hours, let's say I, I worked with somebody who actually had a nail salon and they were wondering, how come I'm not making more money? And then I uh, plotted out for them a spreadsheet that showed all the hours in the day that they could be working. And when they weren't working, it turned out that they were taking, they were only working like 20 hours a week and they didn't even realize that's all they were working was 20 hours a week. So once we started to figure out all the hours they had available and what they could potentially put into their schedule, then we were able to uh, take those expenses, match it to the hours that were there, figure out what we need to charge to go above and beyond. And then I also said to her, if you can't find out online what people are charging, uh, then you need to actually go and have your nails done by different places. And more than likely, they don't know you or they know of your business, but they don't know of you personally. And you'll get a real good sense of what uh, they're charging. That's what I would do if I were you. Again, put out all of your expenses, make a spreadsheet of all of the hours that you're willing to work and that your clients want to have you there. Take a look at what it costs to go to the other places. And now you'll have a good composite picture of what you need to do. The next question is from uh, Kevin Viniski. Kevin writes, when exploring the opportunity to acquire a book of business, what should you be looking for during the initial investigation? How would you structure the potential deal to mitigate risk? I've been approached by similar business to see if I was interested in working together or purchasing a book of business for their for bookkeeping clients. The current owner purchased this book of business previously and has since been hired full time by one of the clients. This would be a nice addition if done correctly. I'm looking for insight on how to handle this process and how best to protect myself. My biggest fear is that the clients will want to leave after a second acquisition transition and I potentially have overpaid or made a bad deal. Thank you. So you could ask the person you're buying from to stay on and let people know that he has brought, he or she has brought on a partner. They make an email introduction uh, to the clients and saying, I brought on this partner. I, he, is going, he or she, uh, that uh, you will be working with them, Kevin. And so you find out if they're comfortable with you working with them. And I would meet with all these bookkeeping clients in person so he could tell them they brought you on as a partner or if he wants to and doesn't even want to say that he wants to sell, I'm selling the business you should meet face to face with all of them so they feel comfortable with you and ask them if they had any questions and if they're good that they should at least give you a three month uh, try to see if they're comfortable with your skill set and if they are that you would hope they would stay on and so you need to meet them all you can't just have him send out a blast email i'm selling the business here's the new guy that won't work for you the other way you could do it is if he doesn't want to make those introductions for you, you could tell them, I'm only paying you on the business that stays and they have to stay at least six months. And then after that, I will uh, provide a payout to you, including the six months 
that I've been working on those clients. So again, you have to um, set up a, a criteria or um, making sure that you set boundaries about what this is going to uh, look like for you and for the person you're acquiring from because you say to them, look, it's going to be new for them. Now they have another new bookkeeper that's going to be ta uh, taking care of them and they need to be reassured that the transition will be smooth. It would be good if we could do Zoom calls or in person with all of your clients and if you can allow me to meet with all of them and reassure them, then we can make this transition work smoothly. If you can't do that, then if you're going to just let them this company is and I don't know what kind of revenue that they bring in I don't know what they charge uh, the companies the tattoo parlors that they work with for the services they provide so you need to know all of that to find out god they're making lots of money here I should be getting part of it the other thing is I'm sure in other parts of the country people are doing your job and you should reach out to them through a trade association or looked on LinkedIn and find out what they're getting compensated. You're not competing with them. You're in a, a special, special ge geographic area. So I would contact people in other parts of the country. I would go to salary.com and see what people who do compliance and education get paid, even if it's in the non-competing industry. So you have these data points because you're going to need to make a case to your boss about why you should get paid more. So if you know uh, they're getting $100 an hour and you know that when you factor in all the cost of running it that they're actually making $75 an hour and you are being paid $15 an hour, then you can go and say to them, look, you're making $75 an hour. I know all the calculations. I think it's only fair that I make $25 an hour, which is only 25% of the cost uh, of doing this, because I bring this unique skill set. And I would also show them, which I've done with clients, show them a spreadsheet. If I leave and go somewhere else, and you have to find somebody with this knowledge, train them, trust them, do all the things, here's what it's going to cost you to do. Here's how many hours it will take you to interview them. Here's how long it will take you to find them. When they calculate all of that in, it could end up being a $25,000 to $50,000 number. I'm asking you for a raise of $20,000 a year. That's $5,000 below the lowest estimate of what it would cost just to find That looks like and once you show them those numbers where you've found out what other people are getting paid in other parts of the country no sounds great to me and I hope to see you very successful again I look forward to answering your questions next month and uh, please have a safe weekend take care